Hello YouTube and welcome back to another Dare to Game video. Today we are covering the final faction in our lore series, covering all the factions in Mountain Blade Bannerlord. Today's topic is the Empire. If you haven't seen the rest of these videos, I strongly suggest checking them out, as I have covered each and every faction, and there is a lot of interesting information for each one. But with that in mind, let's dive on in and learn all there is to know about the Empire, the once great but now declining faction that at one point almost controlled all of Calradia. At the start of the game, the Empire is engaged in a brutal civil war, with three factions vying for power. The North Empire, the South Empire, and the West Empire. Based on the Byzantines from ancient history, the Empire seems to resemble the Vlandians, specializing in heavy infantry and cavalry. However, where the Vlandians' tactics is to mow down the enemy with charge after charge of heavy horse, the Empire requires a more tactical, opportunistic approach. Unlike the Vlandian heavy horse, whose knights carry shields and one-handed lances, the Empire heavy cavalrymen carry large two-handed lances and no shields, as is normal for cataphracts. This leaves them open to volleys of arrows during a charge. However, if you're tactical about your approach and don't leave your horse units open to ranged fire, you can decimate your foes. So as I mentioned before, the Northern Empire, the Western Empire, and the Southern Empire are the three pieces that make up the Empire faction in Mountain Blade Bannerlord. Each empire has its own leader and certain unique features, but for the most part the culture is the same. So I will go through each one of the leaders and territories, but military and cultural information will be universal. So let's start off with the Northern Empire. The Northern Empire shares a border with the Batanians, Sturgeons, and Kuzates, as well as the two other splinters states resulting from the splitting of the Calradic Empire. This empire is led by an influential senator who wants the Senate to resume its right to appoint the new emperor. His name is Senator Lucan. Senator Lucan Astakos is the ruler of the Northern Empire, leader of the Astakos clan, and a claimant to the emperor of the Calradic Empire. During the reign of Emperor Noretzes, Lucan served as a junior officer as part of the Emperor's staff, participating in the Battle of Pendraic. As the Sturgeons stormed the Imperial camp, Lucan escaped as part of Aranikos' group of soldiers back to safety. The northern third of the Empire is ruled by Lucan, who represents a long-standing oligarchic trend in Imperial politics. It holds that strict adherence to Imperial law is the best guarantee that the Empire will not become a tyranny. Oligarchs like Lucan also tend to believe that only landowners can have the extensive education, experience in government, and stake in property to really understand and appreciate the law, and thus the Senate should be supreme. Lucan favors a real Lucan favors a return to an oligarchic Senate, and is politically opposed to the militant populism of Garios, while fundamentally opposed to the hereditary monarchy of Regea. His two imperial contenders. Senators found themselves confronted with populist radicals who would do away with the oligarchy, or feudal aristocrats who would back an absolute monarch and do away with the Senate. Thus, the Senate elected Lucan as emperor, despite the military and aristocracy separately raising their own claimants, drawing the border for a three-way civil war that would follow. Lucan's claim to unify Calradia as emperor relies on him holding the support of what remains of the Imperial Senate. Because of their support, Lucan asserts that he is the only one with legal precedent to be emperor, and Istiana validates this claim in the main questline, referencing that Lucan understands the Empire's laws and traditions better than any of his opponents, making Lucan, by most accounts, the most viable claimant to the Imperial seat. So let's move on to the Southern Empire. The Southern Empire shares a border with the Azerai, Kuzates, and the Vlandians, as well as the two other splinter states resulting from the splitting of the Calradic Empire. This empire is ruled by Regea Petros, the widow of Emperor Aranikos, who claims the throne for her daughter Ira, the only child of the late emperor. Empress Regea Petros is the ruler of the Southern Empire, leader of the Petros clan, and a claimant to the Empress of the Calradic Empire. Regea is widowed and was the wife of Aranikos, the late emperor, who was suspiciously murdered. She is considered by Istiana to be the cleverest of the three imperial claimants. Besides being the widow of Aranikos, she is the mother of his daughter Ira, now her own heir apparent. The southern third of the empire is ruled by Regea, widow of the murdered emperor. For her, politics is personal. All men want their families to inherit what they have, and if you loved Aranikos, then you will support the right of his heirs. Aranikos was indeed loved, and also there are some Calradians who believe that the endless squabbling in civil wars can only be overcome by a king, or, if necessary, a, by a queen. Regea favors a hereditary monarchy over the imperial title, 
with a more feudal system of absolute governance under the emperor. Regea believes politics and history is defined by the law of succession, hereditary claims and dynasties that define right from wrong, and believe that the Calradic civil war is a result of the fundamental law being broken to prevent her and her daughter Ira from succeeding the popular emperor Ernikos. Regea's claim to unify Calradia as empress is purely feudal, and the matter of contention that sparked the Calradian civil war. As Emperor Aranikos was assassinated before he could select his heir, or whether there would be an heir at all, as the Senate traditionally appointed emperors, Regea asserts that, as his wife and the mother of Ira, whom he might have been grooming for rule, she is the rightful empress, and the only claimant whose succession is not a matter of ambition, but purely civic duty. And lastly, we move on to the Western Empire. The Western Empire shares a border with the Batanians and Vlandians, as well as the two other splinter states resulting from the splitting of the Calradic Empire. This empire is led by a veteran who wants the veterans of the empire to choose the new emperor themselves. Garios Kamnos is the ruler of the Western Empire, the leader of the Kamnos clan, and a claimant to the emperor of the Calradic Empire. During the reign of Emperor Noretzis, Garios was a soldier who fought in the Battle of Pendraic and barely escaped with his life allegedly hiding in the woods with his fellow survivors to escape their Batanian persecutors. He views this experience as the formative movement behind his later populist ascendancy as emperor claimant in the Calradic Civil War. The western third of the empire is ruled by Garios, a charismatic general who represents a long-standing populist trend in imperial politics. He is deeply loved by his soldiers, both for his solid record in winning battles and for his insistence that his veterans be compensated in land afterwards. He often demands that the people should settle key issues, but in practice, this usually means an assembly of his soldiers, where his veterans can be counted on to shut down opposition. Garios represents the populist faction of the Calradic Empire, and has the backing of most of the former empire's more esteemed soldiers and commanders. During the waning days of the empire, he allegedly pushed for key reforms such as veteran land grants and popular trial by assembly. As these policies were likely blocked or gridlocked by the oligarchic forces of the Senate and feudal influences of the aristocracy and former emperors. His ascendancy as claimant for the empire is likely a combination of his popularity with the imperial armies and his populist political agenda. Garios's claim to unify Calradia as emperor is based on his own disdain for his predecessors and the Senate. He blames much of the empire's recent decline on incompetent oligarchs and aristocrats whose ancient laws and traditions keep them in power by right of blood or wealth, rather than merit, intellect, or ability. Despite this, though, Garios is purportedly opposed to the oligarchic puppet Lucan and the aristocratic agitator Regea. Garios supposedly governs his own third of the empire by force of his army, and is described as putting down opposition with his soldiers. Thus, Garios, separate from both Lucan and Regea, who rely on tradition and inheritance respectively, believes in the law of might makes right, as his basis for being emperor. The Calradic Empire is not a monarchy. The Calradians insist on this. The emperor, formerly just a military commander, may have taken on most other affairs of state as well. Rather than be elected every few years by the Senate, he may now rule for life, and often be succeeded by his son. The popular assemblies that once divided key policies may have withered away, and the Senate, a gathering of landowners, may have far less power than it did in centuries past. But it is not a monarchy, because it is absolutely forbidden for Calradians to be ruled by a king. The Empire is what happens when a League of City-States conquers a continent. A community once led by free farmers with relatively equal wealth now has vast gaps between the rich and the poor. Institutions designed to prevent one man from becoming a tyrant come into conflict with the necessities of unending warfare, which require unified command. Without any smooth means of succession, the death of an emperor has always been a potential crisis. Usually the emperor nominated an heir, the senate ratified his choice, and the people, meaning the army, acclaimed it. But this did not always happen smoothly and the succession was often settled on the battlefield. The current conflict which broke out when the late Emperor Aranikos was assassinated is the latest of these imperial civil wars. As far as territories go, the Northern Empire has 6 towns, 8 castles, and 11 villages. The Southern Empire has 7 towns, 7 castles, and 32 villages. The Western Empire has 6 towns, 8 castles, and 31 villages. So it should be easy to tell that the North definitely starts out with the weakest territory and infrastructure-wise and the Southern Empire starts out in the best position. 
The Empire is a well-rounded faction and one of the easiest factions to play. You normally get dropped into Empire territories. They also boast strong, diverse infantry with high armor and a nice balance between one-handed and two-handed troops. As far as military strengths go, they have well-armored archer units with the option to go for Palatine Guards, one of the best archers in the game, or very well-trained crossbowmen that are also very well-armored. Overall, they have a very diverse fighting force, and although they are not perfect, they do, for the most part, hold their own against the other strongest units in the game. In addition to this, as a specialist troop, Elite Cataphracts, the highest level cavalry in the Empire, are one of, if not the best Lancer troops in the entire game. They have deadly charges, but do lack maneuverability. But what they lack in maneuverability, they make up for in high damage and strong armor. The Empire also has the added advantage of the Imperial Legionary Troop, which is, by most accounts, the all-around best heavy infantry troop in the game. As far as military weaknesses go, the Empire does have limited options in the Light Cavalry or Mounted Skirmisher Department, having really only one option, that being the Imperial Bucellari, a mounted archer. On the bright side, they are an excellent unit with fast horses, accurate bows, and durable, comprehensive full-body armor. Their other weaknesses is their polearm units, the Imperial Elite Menavliaton. Despite having great armor, good weapons, and overall good stats, they lack one thing that can be a significant weakness depending on the situation. Namely, they ain't got no shields. Overall, militarily, the Empire is the easiest faction to play as when it comes to combat, because their army is so well-rounded and can be recruited from any military settlement, not just the faction you're a member of. As previously mentioned, the Calradic Empire is loosely based on the Byzantine Empire, also known as the Eastern Roman Empire. The Byzantine Empire was a vast and powerful civilization with origins that can be traced to 330 AD, when the Roman Emperor Constantine I dedicated a new Rome on the site of the ancient Greek colony of Byzantium. Though the western half of the Roman Empire crumbled and fell in 476 AD, the eastern half survived for 1,000 more years, spawning a rich tradition of art, literature, and learning, and serving as a military buffer between Europe and Asia. The Byzantine Empire finally fell in 1453, after an Ottoman army stormed Constantinople during the reign of Constantine the 11th. So that does it for this lore video about the Empire from Mountain Blade Bannerlord. I hope you enjoyed it and found it useful in answering any questions you may have had, or just helping explain what these lamellar wearing scale-obsessed lunatics are all about. But in any case, thanks for watching and have a nice day, and I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching another Dare to Game video. If you liked this video, please leave a like and a comment. If you haven't already, be sure to subscribe to the channel. If you like my content and would like to support this channel, consider becoming a member today for as little as $1.99 a month. It makes a huge difference. But in any case, thanks for watching and have a nice day. I'll see you next time.